So basically, he's already assuming the yeah. chiropractic adjustment position, <laughs> which is fine, right? Because we're going to use a variant of that right here. So essentially, I'm going to feel whether I can feel any restriction in spinal mobility. I can feel a little bit right there, and a little bit up there, but a little bit more right here. So this is right at L5, um, and essentially as he brings his knee up, mm -hmm. All right. so I have him in a position where that tissue is uh, coming to tension a little bit right there, and now push your thigh up toward the ceiling against me, gently hold, two, three, four, and release. Let it drop, good. And press up again. Two, three, four, and release. Good. And once more, press again. Two, three, four, and release. And you can use a different body part to block it or whatever. You're supporting it in there too with your... Yes, I'm supporting it a little bit, and I'm, then I'm pushing it down, but I'm controlling how far it goes okay. using my leg. And yep. this is where we're accomplishing doing this technique again? We're releasing some of the restriction around that segment. So if, if L5, for example, was rotated away from me, this is a way that I can rotate it toward me. And it turns out we found out when we were doing the muscle energy techniques with Peg Royce that many times if you are correcting a rotational pattern, you also improve the wedging and vice versa. If you decide to improve wedging, you can often in improve the rotation. So you get more, you get improved mobility in a number of planes by doing a muscle energy technique like this. All right? So lie face up and we're going to check something else. So um, the question then becomes what about a functional impingement of the hip and whether that's playing a role. Okay? And one of the reasons we might suspect that is that, that he had a counter-rotation of the right ilium and sacrum. So that's something that might be a hint. So the issue with functional impingement of the hip is that it's certainly possible with certain kinds of trauma and strains, it almost always happens when someone lands on their butt, falling on the ice or you know, falling out of something and landing on their back. Uh, the body grabs and the femurs tend to go more shallow in the acetabulum. So they're not dislocated. They're just not seated as deeply in the joint as they ideally would be. Right? And I do have patients where it has showed up on x-ray, uh, but they're very few. It's just, you know, the, the little bit of shift that you can see, and they're not essentially to really see how deep it is in the socket, you'd have to be in a whole different orientation to pick it up. The, the patient that I saw it in most clearly is a woman that has a 30-year-old hip replacement, and she couldn't walk properly. She has rheumatoid arthritis, she has other health conditions. Her hip replacement has deteriorated enough that ideally it would be replaced again, but because she's had a history of strokes and TIAs, they don't want to do that. So we have been able to reposition it several times. She, she has many joint replacements, so she falls easily. The proprioception around her rheumatoid arthritic joints isn't so great. And uh, when she falls, it can make her femur subluxate. One, one time recently, it fully dislocated. When she was in the emergency room, they put it back in, but she still couldn't walk on it. She came in to see me and we repositioned it mm. more centrically and deeper in the joint position. And, uh, and basically, I'll tell you what variant of this you would use if you were gonna do it on someone who has a hip replacement, but probably as a massage therapist, you probably don't wanna do that on someone with a hip replacement. You probably want us to take that risk and not you, but, but basically, it, it is doable. Uh, and, and the commonest time that someone that with a hip prosthesis gets into this problem is when they've had a nasty fall. And then they can't walk and well and they get snapping hip and all these other things and they think about whether they're gonna re have to redo their hip 
and often we can get it to settle down without doing that. So basically, if we're gonna check for functional impingement of the hip, one of the things we can do is feel how much give there is in the groin area, right in through here, and feel how much give there is in the groin area, right in through here. And I feel like I'm hitting the tougher tissues, maybe even the bone, very, very quickly over here, and I can go in deeper. Can you see the difference? Yeah. Right? And I, I just okay. can't go that <coughs> far right here. So, yeah. And the patient will tell you, I used to have a crease in here. I can't feel the groin crease the same way. The other things that they will notice is that they don't feel as strong. They can't go up a stair as easily, etc. cetera. Uh, but you don't find any neurological reason for that. Um, they'll also tell you that it, when they first get up after sitting, they, it takes them time to get situated so that they can actually take a step and walk. So there are a series of things that if you hear them, they, they say to you like, oh, maybe they have functional impingement of the hip. Now, the first thing we want to evaluate about the hip, or, or, and actually what I think is most important to evaluate is how much arthritic change there is in the hip whether we're correcting something that's correctable or whether not. So essentially, um, one of the ways to do that is the first movement that someone loses when they're degenerated enough that they might be close to bone on bone is internal rotation. So essentially, he's got about 40 out of, normal is usually 45 degrees or so, he's got about 40 degrees of internal rotation of the left flex femur. Hmm? <laughs> That's just a five degree change. You know, the, when people really need a hip yeah. replacement, it's like when they're down to like five degrees. But I've had patients that can't even go to neutral. Yeah. Right? They can't yeah. get to zero. And that's when they probably aren't going to need hip replacement. So basically, this side will look at it. Okay. So we've got about 20, 25 degrees max out of 45. All right, so it's a significant difference here, all right? Is this where you just give up on the patient? No. <laughs> 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 Bill them first. <laughs> Bill them first. <laughs> okay, so pathic mechanic. Okay, so pathic mechanic for the functional impingement mm -hmm. is that there is generally a non-neurologically, there's no pinched nerve, but they have inhibition of the iliopsoas and the tensor posture, a lot of muscles, sometimes the quads. But basically, we'll look at that. So we'll look at the strength over here. The quad, hold up, good. Let the leg down, hold it right there, hold. Turn it in, hold it right there, good, all right? So he's got, all I'm looking for when I do that test is whether he can meet me with a good, firm resistance. It's the problem is, in muscle testing this safely is that I'm above him. I can use my whole body weight to try to shove his leg down, but that's not a good test. Mm -hmm. So essentially the test is, can he meet me with his pressure? So essentially on this side, we'll take a look at the quad. Mm -hmm, good. And hold right there. Hold right there. All right. And now. Tensor fascia lata, so that's the angle of that muscle. Yeah. Do, your so, first, do the first one again. Okay. No. That quad quad or, you said quad, but it was I'm quad sorry, this is a psoas. So. Oh, the first one is the quad. The first one is the quad. So this is my quad test. Okay. All right. This is my iliopsoas test. And this is my tensor fascia lata test. And you can see that it's significantly weaker than the other side. Um, now, the one caveat with this is that people that are really trained athletes and they're really strong, they can recruit their quad to control the psoas test and the tensor fascia lata test. So in those cases, to isolate it, I have to actually bring the leg lower so that they can't use their quad when it's in this range. And they can't use their TFL when I've got it this low. So basically, I'm, I'm closer to the horizontal to take mm -hmm. out the quad. Mm -hmm. So if you notice that they're using their quad while you're doing it, it's because they're cheating and they don't even know it. Yeah? I thought you were going to talk about that, so I didn't need to try. Um, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> In order to avert the recruitment, do you ever use good hearts allies into the distortion technique? I have not used that, but I do use. 
sort of vaguely remember this, but I don't know how easy it is. But you could. <laughs> All right, so um, if we want to reposition that, essentially we want to create a maneuver that will screw the hip all the way down into the Whoa, joint. Oh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to give you a little background, most of the two techniques that are usually taught for repositioning the femur for physical therapists and chiropractors one is that you yank on the leg and it distracts and you temporarily get a little bit better function but you don't get the change in the groin crease. You usually don't get major changes in the range of motion. Uh, the muscles will test a little bit stronger for a bit, but you don't get that really significant change in where the, the thigh bone is seated. So I like to think of it almost as though you're trying to drop the thigh bone as, you, as though you're gonna be a pole vaulter. You want it to go deep in. And then if you can get it to do that and not to be pulled back out again, in various ways, it makes a, a really big difference. So the maneuver is this. You bring the leg up, you turn the leg into some internal rotation, however much the person can tolerate without hurting their knee, all right? And um, you're gonna ask, again, I'm using my arm against me so that I'm kind of using my whole body to help this, not just sticking my arm out there and having them do it. Now this, the pressure that he's going to use against me is not a gentle muscle energy technique. It is a sub-maximal resistance. So he needs to resist enough that he's actively engaging the adductors and other musculature while I'm bringing his leg through an arc. The arc is going to come all the way up to here, all right? But basically, He's going to be engaging those muscles, but I have to be able to advance the leg to the end point. The end point is just beyond 90 degrees. It's like 110 or so, but you, usually you can get a feel for how far you want to take it. So give me some pressure with this knee down towards your other knee. Mm -hmm. Good. Keep pushing harder. Yeah, that's it. Good. Harder. Keep going. Good. Good. A little less. Good, harder. Yeah, there we go. Okay, now we're going to take a look now at um, the range of motion. We're going to see anything if anything happened there. Okay. Wow. That's really degrees. significant. Degrees. <laughs> Hold the leg right there. Don't let me press. The iliopsoas. Turn it in. Don't let me press. So good strength of those muscles. Um, now I'm going to do the comparative pressure. Can you see how far I can drop into that joint area now? So it's opened up that groin crease because we've got the, the femur that was the anterior and it's now setting in deeper. Mm -hmm. So it looked like you're talking to the iliacus with your thumb again. Um, good question. When in the book, when I did this and we did the pictures for it, I was always stabilizing on the other leg. But what I found was really important is that some people, when they're resisting you when you do this, they're pulling that hip up off the table. And so I found that it's better for me to hold the hip down, and in a way, that almost gives me a focus, that I'm, I want to drop the the angulation of the femur right in there, right just below where my, where my hand is in the groin crease. So it kind of gives me a, a goal of where I'm headed. Um, and I have found that that technique works better than what was in the myofascial book earlier on. <coughs> um, so it's critical when you reposition the femur to make sure that the iliopsoas elongates because otherwise the iliopsoas will just pull it back up again. It's very, it's, it looks like the skinny muscle, but it's very strong, right? And by the same token, as long as the iliopsoas is pretty short, if they take their leg into full external rotation, like uh, to put on their shoe or to do a lotus position or to, they go to sleep at night and they roll over on their belly and they take their hip out, um, the psoas, will leverage the hip 
back into the anterior portion of the joint and you'll lose all the gains that you just made. So it's a, it's a tricky business to stabilize it. The patient needs to have enough arch support that they're not stressing up into that joint all the time when they're walking. Um, and uh, they, they need not to do sit-ups and leg lifts while this is all settling down or the, the psoas will tighten up enough that it can pull the hip back off track. And, and the patient will say to me, they'll say, uh, when I tell them not to do turnout, they'll say, oh, you mean I this? should go like this? <laughs> and I retest them right then and there. And I'll tell you about at least 75% of the time, I have to redo the femur maneuver. Now, basically, I'm probably one of the few people on the face of the earth who thinks that this is this important. I mean, you've learned that it's important. Mm -hmm. You're learning that it's this important. But basically, um, I see this as a major feature that is involved in persistent back pain. The psoas won't let go. It keeps referring. The sacrum won't release. It keeps jamming. Um, I see it also in pers when, when it is contracted like this, it's slightly externally rotated, so it increases torque into the knee. So basically, we see a lot of knee problems with this. Mm -hmm. um, and I get so upset when they re I have patients who've had back and hip problems, and now they have a knee surgery, and as they progress in their knee rehab, they have them doing leg lifts, and I'm like, no. And the patient starts to get all their problems again, and the muscles test weaker. So the physical therapist said, well, you were making great progress, but now these muscles don't work. And, uh, it's, and it's, if they just did the, the uh, rectus strengthening standing with a pulley, they'd be fine. But doing a leg lift engages the psoas, it doesn't isolate it properly, and they get into trouble. So uh, that's my treatise. Do you want to talk about the, the replacement, the Oh yeah, the, the main change with the hip replacement is that you don't want to do major twists as you do it. So basically, when I'm doing someone who has a prosthetic hip, I don't turn it in maximally. I just turn it in a tiny bit, and I have them push directly toward the foot of the table. So I'm just working on the anterior component. I'm not working on the twist.